KPFK Los Angeles and we go now to our special coverage Occupied Isla Vista News. First a reminder that violin virtuosi which was scheduled for this time period will instead be heard Thursday at 10.30 p.m. and Stripe with Jeff Sykes scheduled for Thursday at 10.30 will be heard Thursday at 11.30 p.m because of tonight's special KPFK coverage. Occupied Isla Vista. The situation now is in its sixth day. Trouble seems to be at a minimum tonight. The curfew is over, at least for the present time. We will have complete reports from Isla Vista tonight, along with exclusive reports from KPFK on items never before broadcast by any radio station or printed in any media whatsoever about the situation in Isla Vista. And coming up very shortly, too, we'll have a special report by our correspondent who has uh, been covering this entire story from San Diego, Doug Lewis. We'll have special coverage of the conflicting statements by police officers over the past few days about the situation in Isla Vista. We believe that tonight's coverage is important and we hope you'll stick with us here on KPFK for the complete story as it unfolds of Occupied Isla Vista. Later in the evening, we will be taking your phone calls, your reactions to what's been going on, your thoughts on the entire situation. You'll be able to call us on either 877-5583, 877-5583, if you live in Los Angeles, or if you live in the San Fernando Valley, in one of the beach cities, or in West Los Angeles, at 984-2420, 984-2420. If you live in Santa Barbara, Goleta, or in Isla Vista, you'll be able to call us at area code 213-984-2420, area code 213-984-2420. So now we begin our coverage of Occupied Isla Vista. This is Jack Riley once again with our coverage of Occupied Isla Vista tonight. We're going to go first to San Diego to a gentleman who has been working with us on our coverage these past nights. His name is Doug Lewis and he's with radio station KSDT, the University of California at San Diego station. Doug has been uniquely equipped to participate in our coverage these past nights because, well, among other things, very frankly, he has free telephone service up uh, to Santa Barbara and a, an incredible interest in the story up there. An uncanny knack for picking out the right developments. Are you on the line now, Doug? Yeah, I'm right here. Okay, Doug. Uh, I know you've had a report in the making, and we're ready to go with it if you are. Okay, I'll uh, play the tape, and I'll come on after the tape. Fine. This is Doug Lewis at KSDT in San Diego, reporting for KSDT and for the one and only KPFK in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm entitling this report contradiction for reasons that I hope will be obvious as soon as it's over. I spoke Friday morning after we heard down here at the station that Kevin Moran had been killed in Isla Vista with a Lieutenant Swan, the watch commander that evening, or that morning, at the Isla Vista branch of the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department, and asked him what weapons the sheriffs had at the time of Kevin's death. He told me that they had tear gas. He told me that they had pepper gas in reserve and that they weren't using the pepper gas. He told me they also had 38 caliber revolvers and that they had shotguns with birdshot and that they had carbines. Uh, Kevin incidentally was killed with a dirty caliber bullet fired from a carbine. Um, I spoke with Lieutenant Swan the next evening and asked him the same question in the course of our conversation, and he informed me that they had tear gas. They had pepper gas in reserve. They weren't using the pepper gas. They had 38 caliber revolvers. They had shotguns with bird shot, period. He mentioned nothing about the carbines as he had the night previous to this. This, I mean, this of course, immediately sparked my... Uh, well, let's say, reporter's curiosity. And so I called up a few more times to Santa Barbara, spoke with people, in many cases, people very high up in the line of command, in both the police department and in the sheriff's department, uh, asked them to read official releases, asked them for their opinions, asked them questions that weren't contained, the answers to which weren't contained in the official releases. Uh, we'd get one report from someone, ask the same question as someone else, and we'd get a different report. Uh, now, these were lieutenants, and in some cases, sergeants, people very high up in the chain of command, again, uh, not people way down the line who really didn't know what they were talking about. And I would say 
saying now, is this your opinion or is this uh, the fact? And said, this is the fact. And they all said, this is the fact. Uh, so that was all well and good and everything, but like, I had the impression that maybe someone is trying to hide something. Yes, sir. How do, how do you spell your last name? Just sir? like a bird. S W A N. Very good. Right. Okay. Could you read me the press release concerning Kevin Moran's death? Yes. Kevin P. Moran, 22 years of age, date of birth, 3-15-1948, resided at 895A Camino del Sur, Isla Vista, Colita, California. Kevin Moran was in front of the Bank of America with others who had been putting out the fire inside the bank. Approximately 0-1-15 hours, several shots were heard in the area and Moran was struck by what appears to be a sniper. Moran had helped put out one or two fires in the area prior to 0 one and assisted in keeping some of the persons back who were throwing rocks near the bank when the fire was started. Case still under investigation by the sheriff's detectives. And could you tell me what kind of weapon he was shot with? Not at this point. Uh, that's still under investigation. Uh, the ballistic expert has not given us a uh, final determination. I see. Uh, we received information from another radio station that they had spoken with either you or someone else and that a 30 caliber carbine had been used. Uh, this, where was, this was either a 30 caliber or 7M, and most probably, but that was not confirmed. Since this conversation, of course, uh, we have received confirmation as to the bullet that killed Kevin Moran. It was a 30 out 6 bullet, a 30 caliber bullet. Now, uh, were the police at any time since Thursday carrying this type of weapon, either of those types of weapons? Yeah, I believe that uh, some officers may have been carrying 30 caliber weapons. Those comments from Officer Swan, Watch Commander Officer Swan. These comments from Watch Commander Officer Chickering. Chickering. C H I C K E R I N G. What types of weapons are being issued there in Santa Barbara? In uh, Vista? There are shotguns. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that there are a total of three. Uh, 308 rifles. Mm -hmm. And these are our sniper rifles. And these rifles were checked immediately after the incident, and they had not even been fired. Good check, that's it. Okay. Right. What else? Just our handguns. So the rifle caliber. 38 caliber handguns, the rifles, and the shotgun. Right. And there were, every man did not have a rifle. There were only three out. A preliminary investigation into the tragic death of Kevin Patrick Moran killed on the porch of the Bank of America in Isla Vista during the early morning hours of 18 April 1970, revealed that he was mortally wounded by a ricochet 30-06 caliber bullet. The recovered projectile was so deformed from the ricochet, the positive identification is extremely doubtful. The bullet is presently being examined by the CII crime lab in Sacramento. A Santa Barbara police officer reported that his rifle accidentally discharged during the initial confrontation at the bank at the approximate time of Moran's death. The pandemonium and confusion caused by the heavy exchange of gunfire during the first moments of the conflict make it impossible at this time to accurately determine whether the officer's weapon fired the fatal projectile. The officer was immediately relieved from duty pending a complete investigation by the Office of the Attorney General of the State of California. We are requesting that the findings of this outside agency be presented to a coroner's inquest hearing that will be especially appointed for this purpose. This unusual procedure has been agreed upon by the District Attorney and Sheriff of the County and by the Chief of Police of the City of Santa Barbara to preclude any possible implication of whitewashing this tragic affair. Additionally, we are asking that the coroner's inquest be televised to present the unadulterated facts to all. The circumstances surrounding this tragic event must be thoroughly examined and the facts made available to the parents of the deceased, the students of the university, and to the citizens of this community to ensure confidence in the democratic process of our society. That official release read to me by the secretary of Alfred Trembler. He's the police chief, Santa Barbara police chief. One additional note, I spoke with Detective Homer Aguilar, uh, the investigating officer, before the case was turned over to the Attorney General on the murder of Kevin Moran, and all he had to say was... Well, I'll, I'll I'm only convinced that the boy was shot, killed, Bob Bucket, right? Santa Barbara. And I guess you were at the, uh, in front of the bank when Kevin was shot? Yes. Um, I guess, why don't you just describe us what you saw? I'm not really sure where I should begin, but I guess the best place would be when the bank was 
set on fire. Someone threw a Molotov cocktail through an open doorway and then several people uh, shortly thereafter jumped through the door and uh, they, first of all, they started to beat it with jackets and then they got a fire extinguisher and they put the fire out uh, fairly quickly and there was a little bit of uh, unhappiness, I think, in, you know, from some people out in the street and then other people uh, really weren't that, that upset that they'd put the fire out. But uh, not, not a whole lot happened right after that during a lull period of 10 or 15 minutes. And then uh, the first sheriff trucks came, as everybody really knew they would, and they started uh, throwing out canisters of tear gas and then shooting uh, tear gas cartridges out of gun, guns. And they pulled uh, right into the parking lot in front of the bank. And uh, there were several all around the loop, around the park there. And people were running in all directions. There really weren't too many people there, maybe, I guess maybe, around 150 or so and uh, it happened so quickly that uh, people were forced to run they were gagging and coughing and their eyes were irritated by the, the tear gas the uh, all all I really saw was the first truck enter into the driveway and I saw the lights at the bank and then uh, it was uh, fairly still. There was a little bit of, uh, you'd hear a tear gas canister shot off Bob? every which way, but people were pretty much evacuated from the streets. What I didn't see was any sniping, and I didn't see any real opposition to the sheriffs as they came into the area. Now, in the official release concerning Kevin's death, uh, they talked about the pandemonium and confusion caused by the heavy exchange of gunfire the heavy exchange of gunfire. I'm not really mad. I, I think I'm, you know, perhaps I, perhaps I could have been. I'm, I'm a little bit disgusted and uh, I'm tired of, you know, the, what I consider to be abuse of power on the part of the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department. I think they've, they've covered it up pretty well. It's, you know, one giant hypocrisy as far as I'm concerned. All right, I'm back live now, and I want to say something, uh, which I haven't told anyone here at the radio station. I haven't told you this before, Jack. I received a phone call today from the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department. Um, it was from Officer Zoom. He refused to give me his name. I kept asking him, and he kept mumbling his name, and he informed me that he was well aware of the coverage that I was giving this event, uh, all the phone calls that they had received. He recited all the phone calls to me. I guess they keep a very accurate log there. He gave me the times of all the calls to the Sheriff's Department. Um, told me he, was, he had heard me on KPFK several times. Uh, he'd heard about us from KCSB. And that he didn't particularly like it because he didn't think I was doing a very good job of reporting. Um, I said, what does that mean, a very good job of reporting? And he says, well, although I can't say that... Um, you're taking things out of context or that you're putting any lies across the air. Um, we don't particularly like the kind of uh, coverage you're giving this and uh, the possibly uh, distorted viewpoint. Uh, for the same reason we took KCSB off the air. We took KCSB off the air was his quote. Uh, he informed me that if I taped that conversation and played it over the air, there would be real trouble. Uh, and he just warned me off and told me to be careful. For that reason, I left certain uh, comments out of this tape because uh, he told me that if he heard those over the air, and he recited a few of them, said when he spoke with Officer Swan and so on and so forth, um, he told me if those were over the air, I would be sure to be contacted again, and it wouldn't be by telephone. And I thought I'd throw that in now. He also told me not to say this over the air, but I'm going to do it anyway, because I just don't dig that kind of thing. You just did. Pardon me? You just did say it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I, won't, I didn't yeah, put all... things on the tape, because that's sort of concrete evidence, and he spoke of specifics. Uh, the other comments were addressed to me personally, and uh, don't affect KSDT. I can't take responsibility for this radio station getting in trouble. So that was a personal thing, and I can't take responsibility for you getting in trouble either. So if they want me, they're going to have to get me, and it's got nothing to do with KSDT. Yeah, uh, well, we've been receiving weird calls too, and uh, no one worries about something like that, because... Uh, judging by the phone call response we have received thus far, 
our listeners here at KPFK, and I'm certain the same is true at KSDT in San Diego, have been uh, quite pleased and gratified the, at the fact that uh, there are reporters and radio stations around still interested, despite uh, what some would seek to do, still interested in broadcasting the complete truth of what's going on. We're going to uh, get back to you in just a little bit. Uh, if you, do you want to stay on the line? Okay. Fine. We want to report now the next part of uh, this incident, and we will be doing so uh, as our coverage continues on Occupied Isla Vista. And we're coming up on delay. We will not be taking calls yet. We will be taking calls in a few moments. But there is some other information which we must bring to you, some other information of great importance to this entire story of Occupied Isla Vista. The uh, uh, story is uh, a difficult one to talk about, but it's one which we feel is vital to mention to you tonight on KPFK and on KC KSDT and the other stations which are picking us up simulcasting tonight. Here is uh, the information. KPFK News has learned that the law enforcement officials in Santa Barbara have been using pickup transmitters, bugging devices, Big Brother, if you wish to use that term, to monitor the activities in Isla Vista. There is, in Isla Vista, a street which uh, is known as Embarcadero del Norte. It is the main street in our continuing story of Isla Vista because it is the street on which the Bank of America stands. Across from the Bank of America, and up the street a little bit, are a number of stores. Uh, we're going to tell you about some of them. One of them is a donut shop, which is up the street a bit from the Bank of America. Atop the donut shop is such a pickup transmitter, capable, according to KPFK News sources, informed sources of listening to conversations as far away as 100 yards away. Atop a filling station nearby is another big brother or bugging device capable of picking up conversations up to 100 yards away. Atop the Magic Lantern Theater, which is across the street and uh, uh, up the block a little bit from the Bank of America, is still another bugging device capable of picking up conversations of individuals up to 100 yards away. A sophisticated electronic device, which our KPFK informed source reports to us, is located also on the roof of that building. Still another, in the Bank of America structure itself, is alleged to be still another bugging device capable of picking up conversations from as many as 100 yards away. These bugging devices, we believe, were first used Friday night the night that Kevin Moran was shot dead on the steps of the Bank of America. In addition, KPFK News has learned that there is closed circuit television. Closed circuit television mounted atop a pole near the Bank of America building. That closed circuit television with a zoom lens, remote controlled, is capable of viewing the crowd, viewing the crowd, zeroing in on the crowd, taking shots of the crowd, photographic shots that is, taking individual shots, which are then distributed to law enforcement agencies and campuses of the individuals around the Bank of America. The, censoring, the sensory devices, the electronic listening devices, are so precise, so accurate, that if a Molotov cocktail were to land on the floor of the Bank of America, the sensing device would pick it up as it hit the ground. That's how accurate it is, and as the KPFK source indicated to us, they, the police, know exactly when to come in, and it's because of those electronic snooping devices, the Big Brothers, if you wish, which they have installed. Incidentally, we understand, too, that most of the items involved in this electronic uh, listening have been provided for the law enforcement officials in Santa Barbara under the Federal Safe Streets Act and will be paid for by federal tax dollars. The videotape recorder is alleged to be on cables. However, that's just about as far as cables, wires go in controlling the rest of the uh, facilities which are 
on the scene in Isla Vista. There's been a lot of talk about where the police control center was located during all of this. Our KPFK sources report that the command post has not been in many of the places which were before indicated, but instead has been mobile. That there have been three 960 megahertz microwave transmitters with a 360 degree pattern providing coverage for a command post which is located in a truck disguised as a gas company truck, a Ford Econoline panel truck, a white or light colored truck with apparently a gold stripe loaded down with between fifteen to twenty thousand dollars worth of microwave and electronic gear capable of moving anywhere in a twenty mile area providing instant mobility this is KPFK Los Angeles instant mobility for the uh, command post the California Highway Patrol, which has been, of course, very much involved in this, can be heard very freely by shortwave radio listeners who have reported to us their frequency as 42.180 megahertz. This is the all-state tactical frequency available to hear the CHP as they move in on any campus in the state of California. Their helicopters, our shortwave listeners report, can be picked up at 42.120 megahertz, known as the yellow frequency, whereas the CHP frequency was known as the blue. Also involved, and also available to shortwave listeners, is the frequency of the California, California Law Enforcement Mutual Aid Radio System, known as CLEMARS, which connects the independent police agencies from Santa Barbara City, Santa Barbara County, and the neighboring communities all involved in the uh, uh, unique, multifaceted effort to bring Isla Vista under control. They're on 154.920 megahertz. Two, we are told by our informed source, walkie-talkies with an incredible range of up to 100 miles are operating with three repeater stations, which can be heard on the in frequency at 458.350 megahertz and on the out frequencies at uh, the out conversations at 453.350 megahertz. However, that's not all. The mobile truck, which has been housing all this equipment, includes jamming equipment for all 23 of the uh, channels used in citizens broadcasting. They can be jammed, we are told by our sources, from the mobile command posts. They'll either listen to you or jam you, said our source. The only, the, the only frequency such as CAB, which they have not been able to monitor, we are told, is a frequency used by the Civil Air Patrol. KPFK interviews and information supplied by Dennis Levitt of the Los Angeles Pre Free Press indicate that Kevin Moran, the 22-year-old UCSB student who was gunned down in the early hours of Saturday, perhaps never went into the Bank of America, never went in to fight the fire, had nothing to do with putting out the fire, and instead was simply standing on the steps of the bank when he was shot down on the early hours of Saturday. Most of you remember, if you were listening to KPFK in those early tragic hours, that we announced, as did most people, the early information that a sniper had killed Kevin Moran. However, as you, reheard, as you heard in the reports which Doug Lewis provided you a while back, perhaps uh, the controversy started boiling about whether or not it was a sniper on Saturday. You heard some of the conflicting statements made by the uh, uh, law enforcement officials as they... Uh, uh, provided information to KSDT and KPFK, provided information too for KCSB Radio. That's the FM station in Santa Barbara serving the University of California at Santa Barbara, which was put off the air at 3.30 or so in the morning on Saturday morning, about 2 hours and 15 minutes after Kevin Moran was killed. They were taken off the air at the insistence of the Santa Barbara Deputy Sheriff, Sheriff Webster, who said that he felt that their coverage of listing police areas was detrimental to the police work going on in the area. The station was back on the air the next morning. However, all day Saturday, KCSB-FM was prevented, precluded whatsoever from run running any news of any type, international news, national news, and of course, most importantly, they were precluded from running for the information and benefit and freedom of flow of information of the residents of Isla Vista the news of what was going on in their own community. Sunday, the story was a little bit different. The restrictions were relaxed a little bit. KCSB-FM was allowed to run news coverage, but only international, national, and California news, 
not news of the happenings in their own community, the happenings of most vital interest to the students at the University of California in Santa Barbara. This all changed, however, by 11.30 at night. KPFK Radio, the station you're listening to, started receiving word that the situation would change earlier in the evening, when it became quite obvious that the administration, through the Sheriff's Department, was getting quite frankly uptight about the KPFK coverage of Isla Vista. At that time, KPFK was running phone calls from residents of Isla Vista who were reporting that police were indeed carrying carbine rifles, despite the fact that at that point, in their statements to KPFK, they were denying carrying such weapons. The denials uh, uh, meant nothing to some students who insisted through their eyewitness reports that police were carrying carbines and would have been capable, capable, that is all we reported, of saying that uh, capable of... Uh, gunning down Kevin Moran. Then, as we all know, at 11.34 last, uh, last Sunday night, KCSB was suddenly told that they could go back on the air. They did go back on the air, that is, with local news coverage for the first time since they were forced off the air in those early hours of Saturday, about 48 hours earlier. However, one of the conditions for KCSB FM returning to the air was that they announced to their audience that they should listen to KCSB and not KPFK for coverage of what was going on in Isla Vista. This brings you up to date on some of the events, the coverage which the uh, for, the whether rather whether it be enforcement officials or school administration f officials felt was not right on KPFK concerned the Moran killing. Perhaps the coverage was not right, or so they thought at the time, but less than 24 hours after that, in the afternoon of yesterday, the police chief, the police chief of the city of Santa Barbara, Alfred Tremley, held a news conference, portions of which you heard Doug Lewis play for you, read by the chief secretary, in which they indicated that a police officer indeed had been in the area at the time that Kevin Moran had been shot, that a police officer did in fact discharge his service revolver at about the time that Kevin Moran had been shot. That that revolver could have been, could have been, is not accused of being the gun that resulted in the death of Kevin Moran. The officer has not been charged, he is not accused of any crime. However, the situation did of course change dramatically at that point. What does, this, what, what does this all mean? How can we uh, talk about a situation as strange, as bizarre as this, involving electronic snooping of individuals, taking photographs of individuals, incredibly sophisticated electronic equipment, allegations that snipers killed an individual when today no sniper has been arrested in Isla Vista. Still today, four days now after the alleged snipers were there, if the snipers have been there, what has happened to them? Have they pulled out of town? Could they pull out of that net, tightly, tightly spun net of police officers, perhaps numbering 500 or more, who have been occupying Isla Vista these past days? There was a curfew in Isla Vista until tonight. It was lifted at about 6 o'clock this morning, and apparently the lift will continue for, for quite some time. We understand, according to the watch commander who I spoke with earlier today, that perhaps tomorrow, occupied Isla Vista will again just be Isla Vista, with the police pulling out. But still, none of the problems which led to the confrontations with police two months ago, and again last week, none of those problems solved. How did this whole situation begin th uh, last Thursday? Jerry Rubin was scheduled to speak to the students of the University of California at Santa Barbara, However, he was denied permission to speak. However, Jerry Rubin's wife spoke to the crowd, which had gathered, addressed them in a very militant fashion, and several hours later, a number of students, a large number, gathered in front of the Bank of America in Isla Vista. There was apparently no violence. However, according to police reports, police in dump trucks pulled up and tear gassed the crowd. That was the start of the violence in this new round of trouble at Isla Vista. Where did the bullet come from which killed 22-year-old Kevin Moran, a University of California Santa Barbara student? We're going to try to reconstruct something right now for you from a map which we have. 
perhaps if you have a paper and pencil, you'll want to try to follow along. The best way it might be by following along with the map. Embarcadero del Norte is the main street of Santa Barbara. You can draw that as a straight horizontal line, either in your mind or on a piece of paper. In the center of that, put down the Bank of America as a building on the, uh, well, let's say in the upper part of your page or in the upper part of your mind. With about 30 yards separating the bank from the street, that 30 yards being a parking lot. Okay, now, to the left of the bank in your mind, if the bank is at the top in your mind, picture a perfect park, which you've heard an awful lot about. It's a park, a small one, a very pretty park. Directly across the street from the bank, there's a stop-and-go supermarket. To the left of that, there's a coffee shop. To the left of that, the movie theater. The movie theater, which we spoke of earlier, I believe it's called the Magic Lantern Theater. Then there's a street to the left of that, which is again at the bottom of your mind or of your drawing, and then a standard gasoline station. To the right of the stop-and-go market is a coffee shop, and then the uh, income property management office, a street, and then another filling station, an ENCO station. On the same side of the street as the Bank of America, but to the right of your mind or to the right of your piece of paper, try to picture this. Uh, a donut shop, a couple other shops. Okay. Now, if, if you have any of that constructed in your mind, if I haven't gone too ridiculously fast, picture that when the students gathered about 1 o'clock in the morning in front of the Bank of America on Saturday morning, about 150 students there, apparently, a brief fire went on in the bank. It was extinguished. Kevin Moran was certainly on the steps of the Bank of America. Whether he went inside or not is not yet known. The bullet was fired, according to the best estimates of trajectory which we have been able to find, from the area around the movie theater and the standard gasoline station. However, between the theater gasoline station area and the area where Kevin Moran was shot were three dump trucks housing police. One of them, which had already arrived before, uh, at least a moment before Kevin Moran was killed, in the parking lot of the bank, about 30 yards from where he was shot. A second one, perhaps in front of that coffee shop, and a third one, approximately between the standard station and the uh, movie theater. If the shot had indeed come from a sniper, angry at police, angry with anyone who was trying to stop the disturbances, we ask, why would not the sniper shoot at the police? Perhaps he was shooting at the police. Perhaps his aim was very poor. Well, these are some of the questions which we've been asking ourselves. We've been asking police officials, and we are hoping will certainly come out in the investigation of this tragic incident. These are the questions which uh, we have been asked. We're not trying to originate these things, but we have been asked and... Uh, our listeners have demanded answers to these questions. Doug? Yes. Uh, do you have anything to contribute at this point in the conversation? Do I have anything to say at this point in the conversation? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, I see. Well, um, I have an article here in the San Diego Union. Uh, I guess, what's the date of this? Um, 428. Something. Anyway, I can't read it, but the point is they uh, talk about uh, Tremblay's quotation here and the fact uh, that Tremblay said the officer put the ejected shell casing in his pocket when he realized his weapon had discharged. The officer was relieved of duty when he reported the incident to his chief at 6 a.m. Saturday, several hours later. Now, apparently the reason the officer waited so long was that he had heard initial reports from the lab that a 22 caliber bullet uh, killed uh, Frank Moran, Kevin Moran, excuse me, and consequently, he didn't see any reason to report it. Well, uh, speaking with the watch commander in Santa Barbara, shortly after the, this person was shot, we, I didn't even know his name at the time, uh, he told me right then that it was a 30 caliber bullet, and that was like an hour after he was shot. And so I just questioned this delay and wonder if this is really true, and there's some reason that the police decided to wait so long to relieve this guy from duty. Do you know anything more about that? No, I don't. I have no idea of uh, the 
logistical timetable that went on there. I really have no idea at all. Yeah, there's just too many things, too many loose ends here that people are trying to cover up. Well, whether they're trying to come, cover him up or not uh, is conjecture, of course, but the fact is there, there are too many questions which have not yet been answered, and it's really time that someone did answer him. We have uh, students who, uh, whose lives were certainly in danger these past days with, with tear gas and birdshot and all sorts of stuff coming down from the police. We have students who were living in fear for a number of nights, first because they thought that one of their fellow students had been killed by a sniper, then more in fear because they weren't sure whether it was a sniper or a police officer who killed their fellow student. And, and still the questions have not yet been answered. Uh, why was it uh, that uh, we all heard that there were no carbines used? We still don't know the answer to that one. Really weird. Uh, it's, uh, it's too, too much. Because, uh, I have to interpret some of these things as blatant lies. And times they do that when they realize, uh, when I'm talking to people in Santa Barbara over the phone, and they realize that they said something they shouldn't have. They just, just usually the, the no comment type political maneuver, but at times they just come out and these contradictory remarks. I wish I could have put all those over the air. Uh, they wouldn't let me. And unfortunately, uh, since it's very obvious to everyone that I took all these seeds at KSDT using KSDT facilities, you know, I couldn't take the responsibility for endangering KSDT. <laughs> I think I'm going to get up my own phone and get a tape recorder in my room and get some more phone calls and then play those. It, it's too much. It really is. Yeah, it's a really weird situation. We're going to open up the telephone lines now for any of the residents of Vila Vista, Goleta, Santa Barbara to call us, for those in Los Angeles and for those in San Diego. We have a group, a whole block of numbers tonight, and so uh, get a pencil ready and a piece of paper or a matchbook cover or something and write down the number which is right for your area. If you live in Santa Barbara, in Goleta, in Isla Vista or that area, you can call us at area code 213-984-2420, 984-2420, area code 213. If you live in Los Angeles, you can call us at 877-5583, 877-5583. If you live in San Diego, you can call us to go on the air at... A local San Diego number, 453-1221 or 453-6252. That's 453-1221 or 453-6252, local numbers for residents of San Diego. And if you live in the San Fernando Valley, in one of the beach cities, West Los Angeles or North, telephone numbers 984-2420. 9842420. Do you want to hold on for a minute? Okay, I'll do that. You're on the air. Hello? Yes. Uh, Jack? Yes. Uh, you mentioned some stuff. I'd like to, you know, bring out some information if that would be all right. Yeah, well, this is Dennis Levin on the phone. Dennis is a volunteer at KPFK and is a staff reporter for the Los Angeles Free Press. How are you, Dennis? Pretty good. How you doing? All right. What's up? Well... You mentioned uh, you weren't sure if uh, Kevin Moran went into the bank or not. I have here a statement by Curry Davis, one of those who went into the bank, and he said that he went in with two others and Kevin Moran was not in the area at the time. I have a statement from Thomas Tomiades, uh, Moran's roommate, who went to the bank with Moran upon a response from the AS president who asked for students to come out and help put down these problems. Uh, he says that they came up in an attempt to get to the bank, but by the time they re reached the bank, the fire was already out, and they simply took up positions uh, on the balcony. Uh, a pastor, Otto Bremer, one of the Citizens Committee who was trying to put down the violence, quote, Kevin Moran never went into the bank. These are all people who were with him at the time, and they all are definitely certain that he never went into the bank. Uh, this is in direct contrast to the original police story uh, where they said that Moran was shot as he left the bank. Another point is in the statement by Webster on Monday that there was a confrontation going on with exchange of gunfire at the time of Moran's death. This is also a blatant lie. There was no gunfire going on. There was simply um, buckshot or tear gas, tear, uh, birdshot being shot by police as well as tear gas being shot by police. 
there was, to my knowledge, no gunfight going on at that time. Well, that seems pretty conclusive. Yeah. I was, I, was, I personally was standing there also. I don't know Kevin Moran. I could not, I wouldn't, I did not know him at the time. Uh, but as far as the gunfight, there was, there was no gunfight at all. Yeah, the police, we all heard, did report a gunfight took place. What, what were their words, do you recall? Uh, the exact words? The, uh, the police? Um, I have it here. It would take me a minute to get. Would you like to hold on? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. Here. You're listening to continuing coverage of Occupied Isla Vista from Pacifica Radio. Quote, the pandemonium and confusion caused by the heavy exchange of gunfire during the first moments of the conflict make it impossible at this time to accurately determine whether the officer's weapon fired the fatal projectile. Uh, so they do say that a heavy exchange of gunfire was going on, which was, in my opinion, and I'm sure in the opinion and the fact of any people there, that this is a blatant lie. Where were you, Dennis, when uh, Kevin Moran was shot? Uh, running. As fast as I could. From where? From what position? Well, I was on the uh, edge of the parking lot of the bank, observing, you know, the fire which had started and then had been put out. Uh, the, the trucks came firing volley after volley of tear gas, and I ran as fast as I could. I did not know that Moran was dead until, uh, I would say, maybe a half an hour after it had happened, 45 minutes. Very good. I appreciate your call, Dennis. Anything else you want to throw in at this time? Oh, uh, I guess that will... Oh, one, one thing. You mentioned that Jerry Rubin uh, had a great deal to do with it. The fact that he did not speak had a great deal to do with it. Uh, my impressions from students that were there, it was, it was, it was more simply a flare-up of the problems which caused February, basically the American system. It has not changed at all. The problems are still there. And there have been other problems, the Chancellor's report, which came out from the administration, stressing simply the administration's view of the issues the students were discussing and ignoring the students' uh, points. This played right into their, you know, their beliefs that the administration was not at all uh, sympathetic or listening to their ideas. And when this came out, they, they were, needless to say, incensed. Uh, another problem were the, the court results coming back from the February demonstrations. One young man got six months for a failure to disperse, misdemeanor. Another guy, Mike Cronman, was convicted of battery on an officer when it turned out that a man he had hit, who was, who was hitting a friend of his, was a plainclothes detective. He was convicted of battery on an officer, a felony, and he now faces one to ten. Uh, these, I think, were, were major reasons which caused the, um, the, the flaring up in Isla Vista again. I think that the action by the County Board of Supervisors yesterday also could um, create more problems. The infringement on the freedom of assembly. I think they, in fact, I know they passed an emergency ordinance effective immediately stating that any gathering of 10 or more people is illegal. Now, this is this flagrant uh, violation of their freedom of assembly, rather than uh, curtailing any problems, I think will simply fan the flames. Dennis, if uh, during the evening, as the evening progresses, you think of anything else you want to add, please feel free to call us back. Thank you very much, Jack. I sure will. Fine. That was Dennis Levitt of the Los Angeles Free Press, a reporter there, a staff reporter who was in Santa Barbara uh, during the height of the confrontation. You're on the air. Yes. Yes, I only wanted to say is that I wonder where is that silent majority with all the stuff that's going down here in the United States uh, the president finds uh, glory in announcing the solid majority, you know, is uh, favoring everything that he does. And this whole system is so rotten from the, from the local point of view. I just want to make this one statement, and I hope that the young people will open their eyes and see just what's really going down. When, uh, they, when the Panthers, when they tried to murder the Panthers right up here on 41 Street, the, uh, the here, Longiardi had already ordered the standby of the the uh, National Guard. You see, the police, the National Guards, and every other uh, murderous branch of the service is all against the masses of the people. 
they know that the, that it's so much wrong going on in the country against the masses of people, but still the masses can't eat all the power they have is to assemble and protest, you know. But still the, the government from the local level on up to the highest brings out the army against the people, and then the old judges sit in court with fair prejudice says and hand out life sentence. That's all they are. They're really life sentence. And the criminals go free, which are the murderers that murder, shoot down people, and murder them for nothing. And I don't see, it just shows you what, a, what it's awful that we're living in this kind of country. How can they commit so many murders and then go on at home with their wives and their little baby children? I just can't understand it. That's all I have to say. Well, thank you very much for calling, ma'am. We appreciate it. Doug? Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, we're going to remind our listeners uh, that this is uh, continuing coverage of Occupied Island KPFK Vista Los Angeles. From Pacifica Radio. And we're going to pause five seconds for station identification. This is the Pacifica Radio Network. We're continuing our coverage now of the situation in Isla Vista. If you have anything to contribute to it, if you live in Isla Vista in Goleta, Santa Barbara, you can call us at area code 213-984-2420. 984-2420. If you live in Los Angeles, call us at 877-5583. 877-5583. If you are living in San Diego, a local number there, if you want to go on the air, is 453-1221 or 453-6252. And if you live in the San Fernando Valley, one of the beach cities or West Los Angeles, it's 984-2420, 984-2420 to go on the air on KBFK and Pacifica on this uh, multi-station pickup of occupied Isla Vista. Doug, did you hear uh, the comments from Dennis Levitt of the Free Press? Sure, put him on. Okay. Yeah, can you speak up because uh, we have a little bit of a difficult time hearing you. Okay, can you, how's that? That's fine. Yeah. Uh, I heard what uh, Mr. Lovett said, that little part of another, uh, what I consider to be, by this time, the voice of, uh, of the official lying propaganda apparatus and all of Southern California. It's incredible how a few people with limited resources can discover the truth or at least try to, uh, whereas people like the Los Angeles Times, for instance, with tremendous resources at their disposal, seem to be incapable of even conducting interviews with eyewitnesses, for instance. Even today, if you follow the news broadcast, uh, or, or local radio notwithstanding, but you follow their news reports in the in the uh, in Los Angeles Times, uh, the major media for this area, uh, you find that they, they haven't even yet uh, talked to eyewitnesses, people who were there that night, and yet obviously those people have been available. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it's just it's just absurd. It's more than ridiculous. It's it's uh, like the people who claim to be objective and to uh, to say, you know, I have to stand back, you know, and, and look at both sides of the story. And yet, on the other hand, uh, as the story develops, they're only looking at one side, and and with all their tremendous money and power, uh, they can't even put a reporter in the street. You know, it's, I'd like to commend Doug Lewis, and and, uh, and as far as the threat from that punk sheriff goes, um, you know, I think that that just indicates further uh, the kind of stuff that uh, that's really. Uh, going on and going down, and, uh, and I like to thank you people for uh, putting up a lot of stuff to go through with this. Well, that's quite all right. It's uh, not a matter of what we're doing. It's a matter of what uh, the others have not done, and... Uh, like, the thing, the thing that's really important, though, is that, is that their pretense, that that's upheld every day when you pick up the paper, right, their pretense to being objective, the objective truth is to being the... The, uh, the the liberal uh, uh, all all enlightened media 
you know, it's just a bunch of crap, you know. They're, what they are is they're, they're an arm of devils, right? They're the Ministry of Propaganda. Their pretense to objectivity has nothing to do with truth. It, it, it has to do with, with lies that are, that are couched in the rhetoric of, uh, of uh, you know, the well-formed phrase. But it doesn't have anything to do with the truth, you know. It doesn't have anything to do with, with even uh, the simplest, uh, you know, how do you go about getting the truth? You call someone up and, and try and find out. And when you get five different answers from five different watch officers, you begin to discern that there's a contradiction going on, right? And so you might send someone there to find out what was happening. And and then three days later, you know, or four days later, suddenly they discover that, hey, wow, maybe, just maybe, the police were carrying 30 caliber carbines. You know, that, I, you just get fed up with that stuff after a while. You know, so you appreciate a bunch of people who try to uh, at least bring the information to the people. Well, thank you very much for your comments. We appreciate that. We're going to put you on uh, hold now, and uh, San Diego will have you on hold and get back to you in a little bit. Just a moment. KPFK, you're on the air. Good evening. Uh, tomorrow, I would like to have, a, uh, if I can, get a, a commercial talk show to make a newsmaker call to someone at, uh, is it KCSB? Yes. And um, in in way of enlightenment and getting a little a little bit more information about this, uh, you know, a, a spread a little a little bit wider. And in case I can, uh, some of the questions that I you know that I that I'd like them to ask is uh, uh, about the uh, the shutdown, except for uh, so far as news went uh, over that station over the weekend and. Uh, uh, I'd like some information about this dump truck op operation and things like that. But uh, now, who, uh, would it be cool to uh, uh, ask? As a you know, and I've, I've got to provide some information about uh, 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 who they should ask for, or something like that. Or would it be okay to do this? Well, I don't. What station are you doing this for, ma'am? Oh well, I would suggest it as a. Uh, uh, as a newsmaker call from uh, from a commercial uh, talk show station to uh, uh, K, uh, is it KCSB? Right. And uh, so I'm asking. Well, I'd say the best person they could talk to then would be Cy Godfrey. Cy is the station manager at KCSB. His uh, name is Godfrey. Godfrey, G O D F R E Y. Cy, by the way, has been very cooperative. If you've been listening over the past uh, five or six days to KPFK, you're aware that Cy has been on many a time, uh, bemoaning the fact that when his station was off the air, and has been very uh, kind in his comments about the role that KPFK played in providing the listeners of Santa Barbara with coverage, when uh, indeed otherwise they would have not had coverage of what was going on up there. So uh, we've been uh, on really good terms with Cy. I'm certain that... Uh, You'd be able to answer any questions which you might have. Okay? All right. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. We talk uh, again, it seems, and the question always comes back to uh, the whole business about KCSB FM, which was off the air for so long, from Friday night, actually Saturday morning, about 3.30 in the morning, uh, off the air completely for a few hours, and effectively off the air because they couldn't report on what was going on effectively off the air from uh, uh, 3.30 in the morning on Saturday morning until 11.30 on Sunday night. So uh, the question comes up again, what is the role of broadcasting in all of this? We feel it's an important role because we're certain from the hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of messages, mostly over the telephone, which KPFK received during the height of the disturbances, that radio was the means for people to be calm to be reassured, to know what was actually going on while their city, the city or community, being Isla Vista, was in such grave, grave danger, such grave, grave trouble. It was a very, very difficult situation. Radio reported it. In this case, it was Pacifica Radio and KPFK in Los Angeles, KSDT in San Diego.